ready. First, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians. We're going to continue in chapter 3. We're going to look at just simply two verses this morning. And um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 is where we'll be, if you'll go ahead and turn there. And I want to mention this this morning. So as, as uh, tomorrow, I, I, what time is the parade? 10 o'clock. All right, so... The parades at ten. You want to get down here a little early. This is the this is the thing to do tomorrow. You know, is to be here uh, in Geneva. What better place to be? I've been to a lot of local town parades. I like Geneva as as well, if not better than than any of the small town parades I've been in. Um, Colbert Parade, and where we're from, there was a Colbert always had a Colbert Colbert whatever. Had, always had this parade, and and the biggest thing in the parade was the parade of lawnmowers. And I'm not kidding. It was the biggest thing was all about the riding lawnmowers. Everybody brought out their riding lawnmowers. And that was the highlight of the Colbert Parade. So, listen, we're blessed. Geneva, we've had airplanes do flyovers. We've had all kind of stuff. So, great day tomorrow as we celebrate the, the birthday of our nation. Uh, 246 years, is that correct? Somebody help me with the math. I'm not good with mathing either, Jesse. But 246 years, I believe it is, uh, closing in on 250, which makes me think in just a few years, our church is closing in on 150. So about the time we're going to be celebrating, uh, I think it's a year earlier, uh, because the church was the, this church was first founded in 1875. So we're just a few years from celebrating a, a very, very big, a big deal there. All right, well, here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17, uh, if, I'm, if I'm titling the message this morning, I would, I would title it this, Y'all are the temple of God, okay? And you'll, you'll understand that. Some of you already know, but you'll understand that as we go. Verse 16 and 17, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It's a statement right there. It's not a question. He's making a statement, which you are. You are, which you are the temple of God. Now, Paul dealt in some detail. If you back up to verses 9 through 15, he deals with the promised judgment of, of the believer's labor by the Savior. And, he, and, he's, and he's, he's speaking there. He's foreshadowing uh, 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 of, the, of the judgment seat of Christ. And we, we'll all stand before that. And it's a, you know he's speaking of that. How did we build on the works? How do we build on the foundation? He talked all about that in those verses 9 through 15. What do we build with? What methods are we using? How is it that we're, we're building? And, and whether we, anything that's not done for Christ, not done according to the way Christ would have it done, God's not done by God's plan, all that stuff's going to burn away. And so it's important that we do think God's way. And, and so he speaks of that judgment. But Paul now turns to the present judgment of their, of their lives by the Spirit of God. And he's talking about in the present day that the Spirit of God judges us and, and he's going to judge us. He'll judge our lives and it's a daily thing that the Holy Spirit of God is working in our lives and, and where we're at. And why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't Paul speak of this in view of the judgment seat of Christ? It's imperative that we get our lives in order now and that we not await until it's too late. Amen? You know, one of the greatest... Well, I was going to say... I'm going to use a word to describe a word. One of the greatest regrets we have in life is regret. You know, it, we, we have these regrets, and regrets come when we've not done something that we knew we, we could have done, we know we should have done, and had we, could we go back now, we would have done, right? It's that. We have these regrets. And, and the idea of the Christian life is I don't want to live in regret. I don't want to live that the moment I die and pass into glory, I'm filled with this, oh, man, all the things I could have done, all the things I shouldn't have done. We don't want to live in this thing of regret. There's a, there's a video I show. I'm already off track. But there's a video I show, uh, and I showed in a message. comes from Schindler's List. And it's the very end of the movie where, where Oscar Schindler, it, 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 the war's over, and the Jews are freed, and he's freed thousands of Jews because of the, what he did. The, the sacrifices he made saved thousands of Jews. And yet, at that point... The war's over. He can't do anything else to save anyone else. It's done. And he, and he begins to, he, re, he regrets that he didn't sell the car. He regrets that he didn't sell the ring. He had a gold ring. He had a gold pen. And he, and he regrets that he didn't sell those things. He said, I could have saved one more. He, so he had a regret. And, and it wasn't until that moment that it hit him that I could have done more. 
And, and, and this, is, this is really in light of that is where we should live, folks. We should live in that place where we don't have regret. We live a life that is honoring to God. We live a life that is pleasing unto Him. And it's not about pleasing myself. It's about pleasing Him. And so that's where we're going to get to. Everything hinges here upon the sobering yet splendid fact that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm telling you right now when I say that, some of you are going, Preacher, what does that mean? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I want to help you understand the Spirit, you know, what it means for us, our bodies, to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, first thing here is we have the temple defined. Uh, Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So we're the temple, but here's what he says. Do you not know? Do you not know? He's questioning them. You know, do you not know this? How do you not know this? Much of our failures to live the victorious Christian life stems directly from ignorance. It's not from stupidity. It's not from a lack of availability. It's from ignorance. It's things that we could know, and in many cases, things we should know. And yet we don't. And we we don't live victorious because we walk in bondage to things that are already freed to us. Things where we already have victory. And yet we're still enslaved by things because we're ignorant to the truths of what what the scriptures would tell us. Now Paul uses that very expression, do you not know? He's asking... And every time he uses this, he basically, he's saying to them, they should, they, either they've acknowledged that they know these things or they, they should be obvious to them. And that's what he's saying. He uses this a lot. He says it in chapter 5, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 2, verse 9, and verse 15, chapter 9, verse 13, and verse 24. Now here in 1 Corinthians, he deals with that a lot. He deals with this. He's questioning them. Do you not know? You know this. Come on, people. You know this. Do you not know? Romans 6, 16, and then eleven two. He uses that same phrase, and he's questioning what do they know. So, folks, this morning, we don't want to be ignorant in this area. We don't want to be not victorious because we don't understand who we are now in Christ and what we are in Christ. So that's what we want to look at. So what is the temple? Let's go back and let's talk about that, all right? So I want to give you a brief, quick history as I can as we walk through this to understand the temple. So first thing we have is that God walks with his people. All right, so from man's beginning, God has desired to live and commune with his people. That's been his desire. He wants to be with us. He wants to walk with us and talk with us and have close fellowship and relationship with us. That's been his desire. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Then he goes in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man. Male and female, he created them. In the garden, there was no need for a temple structure. There was no need for a temple structure. Man lived in harmony with God, fellowshiped with God, walked with God, and talked with God in the, in the Garden of Eden. God was with man. Man was sinless. There was no sin in the world. And man and God had a close fellowship. But this perfect picture didn't last long. Adam and Eve, they rebelled. They fall into sin. They're in Genesis chapter 3. And because of sin, they're separated from God. Now they are separated. They can no longer be in fellowship with Him because there is sin in their life. They're banished from the garden. And because of sin, they can no longer be in, a, uh, in His presence. They can no longer walk with Him and talk with Him and have that close communion with Him. And you think about that, folks. I don't know if you've ever just sat and thought about the the change for Adam and Eve. Created in perfection, and the moment they fall into rebellious sin, it wasn't that they accidentally stumbled upon something and, and, and committed a sin. It was God gave one prohibition, one thing he said don't do, and Satan comes in and subtly tricks them, deceives them, uses guile to get their, get, get their eyes on the, the prohibition instead of all the things God had blessed them with. Isn't that the way he works? And isn't it often the way we're trapped? We're trapped by the things that here God says, don't do this, and you got all this over here you can do. And we get caught up in the one thing God says don't do. We're so caught up in that, and we get our eyes on that, and now it's the thing we're consumed with. That's what happened. They fall into sin. How tragic it was for them. What a change to now go from sinless and in fellowship with God, walking with Him in the the cool of the evening in the garden, talking with Him and fellowshipping with Him, to now they're banished from the garden. Now they have no communion with God because they're separated from Him. They're so tragic, but it's not only tragic for them, it's tragic for us. 
because their sin it was handed down to all mankind. So now I fast forward to the Exodus story. And the people of Israel, they've been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And Moses is, is sent by God and led of God to lead the people out of Egypt. And God commanded the people to build a tabernacle. Okay, so there was a command there. And so as the Israelites wandered in the desert, God wanted to inhabit a place with his people. And so in Exodus 25 verse 8, God says, and let them, he tells Moses, and let them, the people, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. Now, that sanctuary is a consecrated place. It's a consecrated thing or place. It's a place that's set apart. It's a place for God to come. And he says, make me this sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, I want you to understand what that word dwell means. It means to reside or permanently stay, okay? He wants to dwell with them. He wants to reside with them. We see here the desire of God's heart is to be in fellowship with us and communion with us. You know, as I prayed, as I, as I was talking about earlier when we started, I, 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 I fear, well, I don't fear, I know. God desires much more to be in communion with us and in fellowship with us than we do with him. There's no doubt of that. We, if, if, if it weren't, I mean, if you think about that, if our desire... If our desire was truly to be in fellowship with God and communion with Him, I mean, it would consume us. It would, cons- it would just eat us up to be close to Him. And we, our sin would so grieve us because we know it separates us from Him. It creates a, not, not that we lose our salvation, but it breaks that, it breaks our rela- our fellowship with Him. That's broken until we get that right. It would grieve us to be in that when we understood that. But for many, there's not a desire. There's not that desire. But the the desire was from God. His desire was to be with us and to dwell with us. See, God spends more time describing. Listen, I find this interesting. If you've read through Exodus, you know, you start your reading plan at the start of the year, right? You blow through Genesis. You go, oh, this is great. You get into Exodus, and, man, it's interesting. You get to the tabernacle. And the Lord describes the, the building of the tabernacle and the detail in there and your eyes glaze over and they cross and you find your head nodding and you go, I can't do this. Look, persevere through that because every word of God is important. Everything they put in there is important. And you read through the tabernacle and all the chapters of the detail. You know, I find it interesting that the Lord uses more description of the tabernacle, the wilderness tabernacle, than he does to tell us about creation. Do you find that interesting? I find it interesting. You know what it says to me? It's very important where God dwells. Where he is going to dwell with man is very important to him. To dwell with man is very important to him. And it was very, everything was laid out it's very, very specific. Not only so he could dwell with man, but to protect man. You know, they could not just come into his presence. It, w- it would have killed him. But it gives great t- detail. So when he made his covenant with Israel, the Lord promised, I will set my tabernacle among you, my dwelling place, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. That's Leviticus 26. So at that time, the people lived in portable tents so that the presence of God then dwelled in the tent of the wilderness tabernacle. And if you go, if you read through there and then you get to Exodus chapter 40 and we see this in, in verse 36, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So his presence, God's presence, was the guiding force that told the people when to stay put and when to pull up stakes and to continue on their journey. God fellowshiped with them. He met with them. He was there with them, and he guided them through this journey. Now we fast forward several hundred years later, and the wilderness tabernacle is replaced by the permanent structure that King Solomon built in in, in Jerusalem called Solomon's Temple. And and just to say this, the, 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 the description of Solomon's temple was that it was, there was nothing that had ever been built. I think it was Josephus that actually said that you, your eyes had not uh, observed beauty until you had seen the tabernacle in Jerusalem. And he said it was, it was almost impossible to behold it in the full sunlight. 
It was covered with gold outside. It was completely covered with gold. So when the sun, the full day sun, shined down on that tabernacle, it was something to see. It would have been blinding. You can imagine that sun reflecting off the gold. It was something to see, and you could see it from a long, 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 long way off. And it was a glory of the world at that time. But God said this about that temple. He said in Isaiah 56, 7, he said, For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's what God, that's how he viewed the temple. uh, Through this temple, God not only manifested his love and care to Israel, but to anyone from any culture who would come there to worship him. So so that temple was a place for folks to come to God. Unfortunately, just like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders rebelled against God, and as a result, the temple was destroyed, and the people are exiled from the land. In Jeremiah 52, it says, Now in the fifth month of the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. Verse 13, He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the, uh, all the houses of the great he burned with fire. So, so in that time, Nebuchadnezzar had, when they, they took the children off into exile, the children of Israel were taken off into exile a, into Babylon, and the temple was destroyed. It was burned to the ground. It was, it was taken down. So that, that came to an end there. So years later, some of the exiled returned to Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. However, the temple system still fell again. If you, if you read in Malachi chapter 1, you can read through verses 6 through 10 there. But I'm just going to read verse 6. It gives you an idea of what was going on. That they, they had forsaken the Lord. They turned their back on him. And Malachi 1, 6 says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reference, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? And the Lord goes on to describe that. But we see there was a turning away again. There was this, a, a, a sin. There was defilement of that temple. And, and we're going to see that it becomes totally useless. And so you, you close the Old Testament right there and you really find yourself in a bad place when you're looking at the temple and, and what's going on with, with God with us in that regard. So this brings us to the New Testament and things are going to change here because now we go from God dwelling in a building with us to God with us, okay? There's a difference in that. So just when we thought the story was coming to a tragic end, Jesus arrives on the scene and the gospel writer John says in John 1.14, he describes Jesus by saying this. He said, the word Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. God became flesh. God became flesh. God in person. So the special word he uses again for dwelt, he says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, is the Greek verbal equivalent of the noun used to describe the tent that God commanded Moses to make. God said, build this tent, build this tabernacle. I will dwell there. And when John writes and he talks about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, it's the same idea. It is to tent or encamp, to occupy, to reside. As God did in the temple of old, it's a symbol of protection and communion. The Lord Jesus Christ now dwells with us. He dwells with us in person. God is with us. No longer does he have to meet in a part of a temple where he's among the people. Now he is with the people. God with us in flesh. Matthew quotes Isaiah 7, 14, st- uh, stating that Jesus is Emmanuel, which, we, which means God with us. Amen? So John and Matthew's message is clear. Jesus is literally God with his people. Colossians 2 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John goes on to record Jesus referring to his own body as the temple. John 2 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Now understand, they're standing close to the temple. They may be, they may be, Jesus may be standing between them and the temple. So they see the temple in the background and he's talking to them and he answers and said, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He says that. Now, they're looking at him, but they're looking at the temple right there, and they're going, yeah, right. In verse 20, they said, Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body, that, that God dwelled with us in the person of Jesus Christ. At Jesus' crucifixion, the curtain of the temple was, 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 uh, that shielded the inner room, the Holy of Holies, uh, of the temple, it's torn from top to bottom. It was rent from top to bottom. It's just totally rent. And it opened up that area there. And so the temple is dead. 
Temple worship is done. When Christ died and he won the the victory on the cross through his sacrificial death and victorious resurrection, he made a new way uh, for God to not only dwell with his people, but for God to now dwell in his people. You see the progression. It went from God, God was dwelling in the garden. Sin put a stop to that. Now God says, build me a tabernacle place that I can come and I will dwell there among you. He dwells among the people. Then Jesus comes and he dwells with the people. He's with them. He's one of us. He's with us. He's here. He's God in flesh. Now when Jesus wins that, you know, the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that accomplished what the temple in Jerusalem never could. Jesus did what that never could. It brought us back into relationship with God in that right relationship. That's what Jesus did. And and so now with what Jesus did, it is now not that God will dwell with his people, but now God is going to dwell in his people. That's the change. And that's where we come to now. God in us. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul hits on the true nature of the church as the body of Christ. The nature of the church, folks, us, we are the body of Christ when he asked that question again. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, you are the temple of God. It means that we, we Christians, true believers in Jesus Christ, are joined together in one family as the church and are a holy dwelling place for God's presence. Amen? That's what, that's what we are as the temple. Now, the New Testament writers, they continue to use temple language, but they're no longer referencing a building. Now, incredibly, they write about the temple. When they write about the temple, they're talking about the people of God, that we are the temple. Paul also taught in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. He says that, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, okay? In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We are being built together. Listen, when, when just say it this, simply this way. When you come to faith in Christ... And we talk about this. We talk about when you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. Uh, Brother Dave Callan was referencing that this morning in our small group time. He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God indwells us as a believer at conversion. If the Holy Spirit of God does not come into you and indwell you at your conversion, you weren't converted. Okay, It's that simple. When you get saved to be born again, the Holy Spirit of God comes into you and dwells in you. And now the Holy Spirit of God is working in you and building you up. And we are that temple. We're the temple. Each one of us individually and collectively together as the church, we are the temple. We are the dwelling place of God Almighty. Does that make sense? You all with me now? You understand temple? Okay? You got it? Let me hear some amens. Okay, and if you don't, you can get with me after. I still got some more to go here. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us the church of Jesus Christ is a spiritual temple made of, listen, living stones. We're considered living stones. Now, it's a metaphor. It's not that we become rocks that are alive and we're blocked together in building a, a physical structure because it's not about a physical structure anymore. It's about a spiritual structure. We're living stones being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Not only is the church as a whole or as the local body the dwelling place of God's presence, but individual believers are also to consider themselves the temple of God's Holy Spirit. So don't get the idea, and, and, and we'll come back to this, but don't get the idea that, that, that church, just it just happens when we come together. You know, we really say this wrong. I was reading a lot of, a lot of stuff the last week on this, and, and one guy was writing, and, and he made a great point. He said, you know, stop, stop saying or stop going to church. Stop going to church. Now, we call this building the church building, right? It's the church. That's where the church is. But it's not where the church is. The church is right now. Because the church is in here. Uh, But that's a building. The church is us. If you are a believer, if you're a child of God, you've been born again, then you are a part of the church. 
So it's not about the buildings. It's not about the, the metal and the studded, the wooden studs and the sheetrock and the paint and the carpet. It's not about those things. It's not about the electrical wiring and the plumbing. It's not about that. That makes this a, busy, a building, a physical structure. We are the church, okay? We are the church. And so when we gather together, we're meeting as the church. We're, it's, the, the church is coming together to meet. But listen, folks, you're, you're a temple everywhere you go all the time. You are the dwelling place of God, okay? You're the temple, a temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Here's another mistake we make. We, 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 think, we think that this is my body. Uh, I'm so sick of my body, my choice. I'm so sick of the hypocrisy and the lies. It's my body, my choice until they want to force a vaccine on people. It's my body, my choice until it's something that disagrees with their, their, their religious, and that's religion, their religion of death or whatever it may be. Um, folks, it, it is not your body. As a, as a child of God, it is not your body. It is not yours to do what you want to with. We want, we want, we want a little Jesus sprinkled in. We want a little sanctification. And, and we want God to, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like what we talk about sometimes in our elder meetings. You know, it's be careful that we don't come with our plan and then we execute our plan and then ask God to bless what we've, we've done. We don't ever want to do that. We want God's plan. We want, as, as a church, we want God's plan. We want His will. We don't want to put our will out there and then ask Him to bless it. But folks, that's what we're doing with our life. We say we're a believer and we live like hell. We live like the lost world. We do the things that the world does. If someone was dropped, an alien was dropped here and said, that's a Christian and that's a not, in many cases, they wouldn't be able to identify the, the difference. They wouldn't know, well, why are they a Christian? What do you mean they're a Christian? What, is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Because there are a lot of Christians that do not live out their faith. And there's some things that in Scripture, this, this next verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yoked together. Tied together. Yoked. They put the yoke on the oxen. Put them, they're tied together now. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The temple of God, there's us, folks. All of this is about what fellowship do we have with the world? We shouldn't have. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, therefore... He said this, all these things. There is no fellowship. The church and the world should not be fellowshipping together. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. doesn't say to be uh, isolated. You know, we're, we're, to be, we're to be in the world. It's talking about the of the world. We're not to be of the world. We should be different than the world. We should be separated from the world. And that means I'm not taking part in the sinful things of the world. I'm not compromising with the world in any way, shape, or form. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we've got an idea that we're the temple, okay? We are now, we're the temple. You with me? Everybody's with me. So the warning now about our bodies. Look at the warning that's given here about our bodies. And it's about our bodies individually and our bodies collectively. We have indeed been bought with a price. We've already talked about that. 1 Peter 1, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold for your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but we were redeemed, look, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It was Christ's blood that purchased us out of slavery of sin 
and, and set us free forever. Amen? It was Christ's blood that did that. Folks, if we just dwell on that right there, it'll motivate your heart to live holy and righteously. We get our, we get our eyes off of that. We get our eyes off of that, and we become very complacent very quickly as believers that, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, and I'm going to heaven. So, so it, it's almost like it's a license just to live like I want to because I know I'm going to heaven. I'll tell you, if that's your attitude, I'm not sure you're going to heaven because I'm not sure you're truly born again if your attitude is I can just do what I want to and, and because I'm already forgiven. God doesn't give us that right. We don't have that right at all. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 17, again, we'll read this. It says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. As Christians, folks, our bodies are God's temple. We are to use them to glorify God. And Paul gives strong warning here about defiling the temple. And that word there, when he says anyone who defiles the temple, the word is, is like to mar it, to corrupt it. Okay? I mean, it's to bring sin into it and these, these, these types of things. If God meant simply to convey the idea that the Spirit lives within the believer, he could well have used words such as home, house, or residence. He didn't. By choosing the word temple, he described the Spirit's dwelling. He conveys the idea that our bodies are the shrine or the sacred place in which the Spirit not only lives, but is worshipped, revered, and honored. Therefore, how we behave, how we think, how we speak, and what we let into the temple through our eyes and our ears and our mouths becomes critically important as well. For every thought, word, and deed is in his view. Everything, folks, everything we do is in his view. He sees it all. Nothing's getting by him. You know, and we understand that the Lord will never leave us, uh, but it is entirely possible and probably probable with most of us that at some time or another we have grieved the Holy Spirit. Amen? And we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul goes on and says, but he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Now, it's all too easy for us uh, to defile our bodies. It's, it's just easy. There's so many things out there, so many ways, there's so many distractions in life, there's so many things that can defile our bodies, thus grieving the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We can defile ourselves by the books we read, by the movies we watch, or by the habits we indulge, or by the lust we express, or by the thoughts we entertain. All of these things can defile us. So it's so important that we walk with God. We walk in the, the Spirit that we not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Folks, this is all about we do not want to defile. It's not about, you know, here, what's the lie? Well, you know, it, it, it's just me. It doesn't hurt anybody else. It's just me. Have y'all ever heard that? You know, it's, it's just, you know, if I do, the, you know, it's not hurting anybody else if I look at that. It's not hurting anybody else if I drink that. It's not hurting anybody else if I smoke that. It's not hurting anybody else. Let me just tell you, your sin does hurt others. That's a lie of the pit of hell. Everything we do affects somebody else. But I'm going to tell you what it does. When we defile our bodies, we are defiling the very temple of God. I don't think we fully grasp that. That everything I do, God indwells me. He lives here. We should, we should worship Him. We should think, I mean, we have communion with Him all the time. We wouldn't come in here and spray paint the walls. We wouldn't come in here and throw a big party. We wouldn't come in. We would honor this building more sometimes than we honor our own bodies. The temple of God. God didn't send Jesus to die for our sin for us to continue to live in sin. Amen? Jesus didn't take our sin and die for it just, just so we can live however we want to today. Romans 6, 1, so what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall he, we who died to sin live any longer in it? 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's how we should live. We should live our lives in, 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 the, in the fear of and, 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 and in the holiness of the fear of God. 
Now, let's go back. The temple, I, I described the temple was beautiful, amen? What it said, the temple was just a beautiful place covered with gold and, and almost impossible to look at. And, and, but the, the temple wasn't just beautiful. It was holy. See, it was holy, so holy. And when you go back, not only the temple, but if you go back to the tabernacle, that wilderness tabernacle that, and with the Ark of the Covenant and all the things that went in there, all of that was holy. And it was so holy, in fact, that when a man named Uzzah reached out to steady the Ark so that it wouldn't fall, the oxen had something that happened and the, and the, and the Ark shifted and Uzzah, who knew you don't touch, you don't touch the Ark of the Covenant, there was strict instruction to that. Well, it's falling. Who wouldn't protect the ark? Well, you wouldn't let it fall, right? Praise God, you wouldn't dare let that fall. God said, don't touch it. He didn't say, don't touch it unless. He said, don't touch it. There was, there was prescribed way with him. It was holy. And so as that thing shifted and as the, as the, as the ark begins to slide, Uzzah goes out and he puts his hand upon it. It says, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him there for his error. He struck him dead and he died there by the ark of God. Now people would look at that and go, wow, you know, God is, man, that, how could he do that? How could he kill somebody who was doing the right thing? He was not doing the right thing, folks. God said, don't do that. God said, that was holy. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, when you read that, and I don't know how your translation reads, but English doesn't do a very good job with you with the word you. Y'all know this, right? So I can say you. Who am I talking to? You. You. I'm talking to you. Collect, it's plural, right? Or I can talk to you. Okay? That's singular. You, that's plural. Second person plural. And so in this passage right here, actually Paul's writing, when he's writing that, the word you he uses there is the second person plural. And so what he's saying uh, as he's writing this, Paul was from the south, if y'all didn't know that. Paul's from the south. And Paul says, he says that, do y'all not know that y'all are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in y'all? So it's, hey, y'all, you all, you all, you know that you all are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you all, in all y'all. <laughs> That's what Paul would have said. I think that's what he did say, and they just they wrote it different. But that's what. He, uh, so the idea, I mean, and, and now he he it's, it's plural. He's talking to them collectively, but he's talking to the church. He's talking to the body, and he's talking to them collectively. You, but also singular to you. You can't be a part of that body. You can't be if you're not yourself a part of the temple. If you're not the temple of God individually, you can't be the temple of God collectively. But he's writing here because he's dealing with issues within the church. And now he's, let's go back to this, because folks, there's, there's some warnings there. When he tells about this defiling of, of the temple, he says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now look, as believers, we know that when we get into sin, what does God do? What does he do? He chastises us, he corrects us, he spanks us, and he takes you behind the woodshed. If he doesn't, when you get into sin, you're not his. Just know that. If you're not facing chastisement, if you're not facing conviction, if you're not being taken out behind the woodshed for your sin by God, then you're not his child because he corrects his children. He always does. And there will come a time, you get far enough away from God, God may strike you dead. He may take you out. And you go, well, I don't know if I believe that, preacher. I do believe it. In fact, I have, some, I have, a, I have, I have one friend in particular. I can give you the whole testimony of it. I believe with all my heart he, he was saved. But he came to a place he had gotten so far away from the Lord, he was to a place of rejecting God. And like, I don't even believe that anymore. And God struck him dead. Struck him dead. And I believe with all my heart, based on his testimony and what I saw in his life, I believe he knew the Lord. And I believe he got so far away and God said, hey, you're, you're, you're so no, no good to me and the kingdom right now. You're no good to yourself. I'm going to take you out of here before you do any more damage. There's a warning. If anyone defiles the temple of God corrupts, mars, to lead away. 
God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are. Now, what he says is, you know, the two verbs that come together, the word for destroy is the same as the word for defile. So anyone who defiles, corrupts, mars, leads away, destroys, that's the word there, uh, God will destroy him. He will deal with that. It's the same, it's the same word. The two verbs come together, and basically it, it means God will ruin the ruiner of his temple. Now, who can be the ruiner of your temple? You can. God, God will deal with you if you continue in your sin. But there's a warning here for the church. And that's the context of this is he's dealing with this. There's a lot for us to learn that applies to us today. But he goes back to what has he been dealing with? There were divisions in the church. Now, he, he's laying this out the first time right here because he wants them, and he's going to deal with this a lot throughout this chapter. Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? And what he says, do you not know you are the temple? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. God indwells you. He, he, he is dwelling in you. He is, he is communing with you. And you together make up the temple. So here's what happens, folks. What we can do is we can sin in the church. We, as a part of the temple, when we defile the temple. And what is this? You all are the temple of God. You're the temple of God, and you're the temple of God, and you all are the temple of God. Now, I can bring sin in here. And if anyone defiles the temple, what if I bring in bad doctrine? What if I come in here with, 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 with bad teaching, and it's designed to pull you away from the Lord? It happens all the time. The lies and and the deception that comes into pulpits where men are, are teaching not the Word of God, they're teaching lies designed to lead people astray. What if I start to do that? What if I, through my leadership, I begin to divide this church? God will deal with me. Maybe to the point that He destroys me and takes me out. There's a warning for all of us. He says, he says do not mar. What were they doing? They were bickering and fighting. They had their cliques going. They had their divisions going. They had their, their little clubs going. Hey, we're of the Paul Club. A Paul Club meets on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. We get together. And then the, the, the uh, um, um, whoever, the other ones. Apollos. I had an O in my head and I couldn't, I couldn't come up with Apollos. Apollos and they meet on Thursday nights. And then those who follow Peter, they meet on Saturday afternoons at 4.30. So, and they like you to bring finger food. So if you're a part of that group, you got to come at that time. Those that were of Jesus, they meet on Sunday nights because, you know, it's the holy night. So they're, they were a little more righteous and it was the right time. <laughs> so we're of the Lord only. And, and so, it, you know, you see what I'm saying, though? That wasn't right. God, and, and Paul's dealing with that. God's dealing with that. And so it was their attitudes that were wrong. There was sin in the church. They were dividing the church. They were defiling the church, the temple of God. Not the building, but the temple. You all, y'all, you got it? There's a strong warning here for us individually. There's a strong warning for us as a church to keep it right. And, and, and you know, as we, as, and probably over the last Several, well, I guess since I've been here, this has really come up more and more and more. But we, we see more and more the importance of church discipline. And as much as we don't like it and people don't like it, there, it's important that we do that because we have to protect the fellowship. Amen? We have to protect this. It's our responsibility to look out for each other. It's mine and Raymond and John's. It's our responsibility as elders of the church to look and defend and protect what's going on in our church. But it's important for us to deal with that from a, a, a standpoint of church discipline because if there's sin that starts here and we deal with it, the whole idea is to get that person to get their heart right with God. You know, if i got a bad attitude and you confront me, and I've had this happen. I've had it happen. You know, somebody confronts you with something, and I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but most of us will be this way. Somebody confronts you with something, and what do you do? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you know, we build a wall up. <laughs> I hate me. <laughs> But you know, if we got any integrity, we go back and we think about it. And we go back and pray about it. 
and you realize, you know what, what they said is true, and you get on your face before God and you repent and you confess it, and you get it right with Him and you get it right with people around you. But if no one had said anything and no one had confronted me with that, it, it couldn't be changed. I never forget, I had a guy at UPS got me years ago. He was a, he was a Marine. He was a black guy, big black guy, ball-headed, um, shaved that head, and he was about 6'2". He could have snapped me like a twig. And, and I had gotten on him about something one day, and i come across just the wrong way, come across real hard. And he confronted me later. He waited till I was gone. He came down. This is at UPS, and he comes in a truck, the back of the truck with me. And he could have just crumbled me up and stuffed me in a box. But he just told me, he said, look, he said, the way you talked to me, he said, I didn't do that. That was one of the guys on my back. I didn't do that. He said, but the way you, the way you can at me, he said, I, I didn't appreciate it. He said, it was disrespectful. He said, I wish you wouldn't do that again. And, I, you know, I'm like, Psh, yeah, Psh, I don't remember. I mean, it was Psh, whatever, you know, yeah, all right, well, you're so soft. Psh, that's my attitude as, I, as he could have killed me. But I thought about it, and and to this, I'm I'm not I'm with absolute integrity. I can tell you this: I know of three times I've gone back to him and thanked him for telling me that, because he confronted me on something, and, and it opened my eyes to something that I constantly have to deal with: is the way you talk to people. You don't have to, you know. We all have weak areas, amen. We all have areas we struggle with. We can't just be blind to them and just let that go. We got to put it before the Lord. Deal with what's going on in your own life. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Live your life as that holy temple. Don't compromise. Don't defile the temple of God. And in this fellowship here, do everything you can to defend and protect this temple, the temple of God. Amen? Amen. Pastor Aaron, you and the team can come.